took all in. This is Coogan Cassius for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Well, we had a bit of a fucking mare there. A mare? 20, I mean, let's just, let's just make sure people picture what's just happened here. So I came down to do a little thing with you at 11 o'clock on Zoom. I had to do a Sky Sports news piece. Sorry, but you know how it is. And then I had to do 11.30, I had to return upstairs for the maths homeschooling. Now I've finished, come back down. We had 20 minutes trying to sort it out. Now I'm sitting with holding up my phone rather than my laptop. So we're ready to go, mate. Have you got a madrum off top? Yeah. Can we have a look? Nice. See that? Team Madrimov. Nice. Actually looking quite ripped. What does it say on the side of it? Where? Oh, right, okay. Go on, it's the sponsors. All right, okay. Yeah. How are you, Edward? I'm very well, actually, mate. I'm, um... You no, know, I've got to be honest. Like, when it all started, I thought, oh, my God, lockdown. And then I went... I've been through sort of some ups and downs. I don't know. I guess everybody has sort of... Started off and I thought, actually, it's not too bad. The sun was shining and then then about two weeks in, I started to panic a little bit and think, oh, I'm not sure I can handle all this anymore. And I have to be honest, I feel great. I've been sleeping eight hours a night, every night, obviously on the same time zone. Um, been working out every day. Obviously, that's you can see that. Obviously. And um, eating well. Yeah, and and really seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I think I think that's probably the thing that's. I think what's getting me through at the moment is okay. We've got a week tomorrow, till basically the end of lockdown. Now we do know that that might not be the end of lockdown, but I'm sort of putting my hope on the fact that next Thursday we are going to hear, okay, you can go back to work, right? but adhering to the social distancing rules. We're not going to hear next Wednesday, Thursday, right, you can start boxing again, mate. Go on, crack on at Spurs with AJ. But I do feel like, I don't know if you feel it as well, that we're on the verge of getting some kind of news that will just give us a little bit of hope. And that's why I said yesterday on my Instagram post, I'm so sick and tired of people. Like, we all know it is absolutely, it's been horrendous, right? Horrendous for the country. People have, loved, have lost loved ones. The NHS has done an incredible job. But when there's good news, don't you think we should let people know about it? Yeah. And when there's hope, don't you think we should let people know about it? I know probably two or three people that know people who, have, who there's been people hang themselves on their road in the last week. So, like, the only, only hope we have is possible good news that we will return to normal, that businesses will bounce back. So I just felt yesterday, like, and it's not even that people saying, oh, you're just digging Piers Morgan out. I said, well, kind of, but he doesn't even seem to want to publicise or dramatise good news with the same parity as the bad news. That makes sense. So it's almost like, Oh, I'm questioning. You've got to question the government. You've got to question authority. But we are all in this together. It's not helping, is it? At least try and motivate people and to bounce back and give them hope to bounce back. Because I've said in so many news before, the mental health side of this is going to is going to basically um, cause the same kind of problems, the same kind of deaths as the disease itself. You know, and we just got now. I feel like you know, Boris's speech was all right. I like the line, we're not quite ready to start our engines yet, but I would have preferred get ready to start your engines. You know, warm them up, give them a little tickle, put the oil on. Do you know what I mean? Rather than, gosh, so it is, it's hang in there, but get ready because the light is at the end of the tunnel. And you have to, do you think people wait, waking up every day with problems? Worrying about how they're going to pay their bills. Worrying if their job is safe. Worrying if they can still send their kids to school. Worrying if whatever it might be. Do you think they're waking up every morning in all this negativity and going, oh, well, you know, they're not. They need some positivity. So if that can come, even if that can come from me, you know, or you, 
or anyone with any kind of platform to say, because that could be the difference between saving someone's life. Don't you agree? I agree with that. Um, Piers Morgan obviously has had loads of the government ministers come on and I get what he's doing, but... No, but he's got to get... Look, he wants to create... Ra- There's a difference between telling people the truth and creating ratings. I don't disagree with the content of, of his questions. I don't disagree with his attitude in questioning the government. But you've just got to have some parity to, you know, say, why not say, uh, you know, it's a disgrace there's not enough PPE equipment, you know, and this, and we want to find out why. But, guys, we're all in this together. Hang on in there. There has been fewer infections. There has been fewer deaths. So we will continue to press for questions. But Great Britain, hang in there. We're on the verge of beating this. It's just like, this is the amount of deaths today. And thousands more in the care homes this is the biggest national disaster of all time we get that we understand and we have to we have to tell the truth but he has got a risk but he has got such a big platform he could help himself save people's lives he could help motivate the nation by giving them that hope him Piers Morgan not a prime minister not an MP this is the world we live in so if I can put something out to give someone hope and you can and other people can we have to try and do it because like i said before people are searching for hope and if they don't find it you know what the consequences are it's depression it's suicide it's lack of motivation it's all these things that spiral into a dark dark place so we know there's gray clouds but when there's sunshine at least report it let's talk about it Ed, can, anyway, I, can, I, can I have a request? Can I make a request? Song? What? No, can you oh. put your phone somewhere positioned because it's all over the gaff. It's like... Is it? Like an earthquake going on. Yeah, but I didn't want to stop your flow. Hold on. Just worry, a bit worried about the old... Uh... Can I not do it that way, no? No, it just it looks funny when it comes uh, when it comes out. But if you could just position it on a book, you know, you've probably got a lot of books at home. Loads, yeah. A mug, anything. Lovely. Whoa. Hold tight. Uh, to... That didn't really work. Hang on. It's going well. I haven't got to do that whole uh, rant again, have I? No, no, no. We're good. We'll keep it. What's at yeah. the bottom here? What, what, what's blocking part of the screen? Oh, that's the a book, here? isn't it? Hang on. Hold on. Let me get a smaller book for you. For fuck's sake. Oh, where's it gone now? In line, where? Right. Oh. Hold on. Ed, why are you putting it? Why are you putting the phone in? Like that? Yeah, but are you going to be able to hold that position? Try, yeah. Uh... Ed, why are you putting the phone in front of the book? You know, like, imagine that's your book. Just, just put your phone like in front of the book. <laughs> it slides off. It's a glass table. Um, hold up. Mate, this is great viewing. Probably is actually. Where's the um, you just gotta prop it up, mate. I'm propping it up, but there's a I need something to put (sighs) Ed stack two books on top of each other, yeah, and just. Stack two books on top of each other and put your phone in front and just let it lean a little bit. Well, it's not, it's got, it's not going to lean on anything, is it? Oh, I see what you mean. Hang on. Get those pillows out of the way. <laughs> Hold up. I think we're on the verge of something here. Hold up. 
Oi, oi! Hey, hey. There you go. All right, son? All right. I'm, I'm leaving all that in. Um, Ed, okay. let, let's, let's get straight into some of the talking points from the last week. Obviously, I'm going to start with um, this whole situation with uh, Dylan White and, <laughs> and Andy Ruiz. Yeah. So, initially, Andy Ruiz comes out a few days ago and says it's lies that a $5 million offer was offered. So then Dylan White obviously put some of your emails, I'm assuming with your consent. Not well. I to mean Tom Brown. Yeah, when I send when I send that sort of stuff to Dillian, it's not you know, I know that it has the chance of going out somewhere on social media. So just just to make it really simple for you, what happened was we made Andy Reese an offer to fight Dillian White in England. Okay, this was some time ago. Um, the answer was no. To be fair, it weren't a great offer, but you know it was it was it was the max that we could afford. Um, you know, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was the max that we could afford for for the fight in the UK, right? So then we spoke to Dazone, we spoke to Dylan. I said, look, we could do the fight in the US. It's massive. So I then made an offer to Tom Brown and Louis de Cubis for four million dollars. Okay. We basically could have gone up to five million. And I spoke to Louis de Cubis and I spoke to Tom Brown and alluded to that. But there was we never put a, a five million offer in writing. It was only four million. But to be fair, there is an argument they knew it would be five and they they did. But to be fair to them, like arguments both ways, that the in the in writing offer was four million. Okay. So Dillian said, you know, we made you an offer of four million. So what I said to Dillian was when I messaged him, I said, go back to him on social media and just say, no, you if you want to play it like that, the official offer, even though you knew you could get five, was four million. But you up for it for five. Because I spoke to Eddie and he said, game on. But he sort of just posted, he just posted my message to him, really. So that's basically the situation. Uh, one of the offers was four million. I spoke to their team and said, there's a little bit of movement. Um, if he's interested for five million, no problem. Let's go. Do you know what I found really interesting from that email that he put online? You know, like when you think of it and you think like when an offer is being made and you think it's going to be some like complex worded email uh, outlining loads of things. But it was literally just you going, four million, do you fancy it, mate? Oh, mate yeah. Well, basically what happens is, and this is, this is where I'm coming from with the wilder stuff, if you remember. I will go back on that. But when you have an offer that's made, the next thing is you say, uh, here's the offer, right? Next thing, someone goes, okay, can you send me a contract, please? Right? So when we had an offer from Wilder himself, which was, 50 million, mate. We went, all right then, send the contract. And they went, uh, you've got to agree to it first. And we said, well, we're interested, but send the contract. No, not until you publicly say you're accepting it. It's like, well, we don't know what the terms are. So I could offer Andy Reese 4 million, but in the contract, he's got to come to the ring with his old boy hanging out. You're not going to accept it, are you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Can you imagine? You imagine in the wilder, Josh. This is what people don't understand. You imagine the wilder offer. Understand this: we asked to see a contract. They wouldn't send one to us. How ridiculous is that? So what? We want to come out in public and go, "Yeah, we've had an offer. We accept. We're in." And then you get the contract, and it says, "Oh, the fight's going to be in Alabama," and it's going to be on, uh, I don't know, a network that we're not allowed to fight on. And Joshua uh, has got to wear 18-ounce gloves. And he's got to walk second. And he's, like, that's the devil of the detail. So by them asking for a contract, it doesn't mean they're fighting Dillian White. It means we're interested. Show me the terms so we can actually consider this properly. We didn't get that far. We just got, nah. So on record... $5 million to Andy Ruiz if, if he wants it to fight Dillian White. But is this, 
a view to what could happen after the Povetkin fight? Well, it could be instead of the Povetkin. I mean, right now, we want to make the Povetkin fight. And Dillian White is one of the people that is saying, oh, I'm up for fighting behind closed doors against Povetkin. And what we're trying to do is, a lot of people are saying, you can't stage the big fights behind closed doors. I'm trying to take that perception away. I want to stage some of the big fights behind closed doors because you know what? If we wait too long, we won't have a choice. So let's crack on now. Yes, we're going to lose money. Yes, it's going to be expensive. But we've got to overcome this. We can't just come back from boxing. You know, we'll come back with two or three sort of pumped up next gen shows and then I want to bounce straight in to White against Povetkin. If Ruiz wants to step up, for me, I have absolutely no belief at all that Andy Ruiz will fight Dillian White for $5 million, or at all. Because it's not even Andy Ruiz, it's just that I think they'll probably want to keep him on PBC. So I haven't made a song and dance out of it, and I like Andy Ruiz as well. And Andy Ruiz will fight anyone, by the way. He's not scared of Dillian White. But there is an offer there for him if he wants to fight him. Ed, let me just ask you. So, you announced the Povetkin show, yeah? Mm-hmm. And White, for the, which would have been this weekend. Yeah. So, contracts have been signed, everything's been mm-hmm. done. So Force, force majeure now. So, so, what would happen is that fight... Yeah, all kinds of different scenarios in a force majeure, okay? Number one is, and, and, a, and a good example would have been a Canelo-Billy Joe Saunders contract, which we didn't sign because we'd only just agreed terms and it wasn't ready for signature, where that fight is due to take place on May the 2nd. And if there's a force majeure, which this would class as, that fight evaporates, completely goes away. There might be another force majeure, which says the parties have to now put a new date in by X. So there's all kinds of different contracts. So in a scenario of Povetkin, that might be one where we would be able to take another fight. To be honest with you, I don't believe Ruiz. Dillian White is in camp in Portugal. He's ready to fight in July. Okay? So, I would... We're up for doing Ruiz in July or August. Sorry, Povetkin in July or August. And then Ruiz in November. Anything's possible right now. But certain contracts will, will obviously um, involve different clauses. And some... Fights can fall away. Some fights can be rescheduled, etc. But you talk about the big shows going behind closed doors. You wouldn't put Joshua behind closed doors, would you? If we have to, I would. I don't want to. I mean, look, when you look back at those pictures three years ago today, one of the greatest nights yeah. anyone's ever had. I mean, I, I'm, do you remember? I know you weren't there. Um, so it's a situation where those iconic moments, those, that, you know, that, that visual impact is so important for Joshua's brand, so important for the brand of boxing, so important for our country. I don't want to do that behind closed doors. So I want to give ourselves every opportunity to stage AJ in front of a crowd. Now, we have to probably bite the bullet and say he's only going to box once this year. So if that's the case, we're okay to go in September or October or you know, don't really want to go much further. Now, he hasn't boxed nearly for a year since then. But if we can't... So my, my preference is AJ with a crowd in the UK. My next preference is AJ in another country with a crowd. And my last result is AJ behind closed doors. So it's a possibility. It yeah. is, if it has to be. I'm not going to... I'm not going to hold his career up to a point where he hasn't boxed in a year. It'd be ridiculous. So we've got to do what we've got to do. It's just on those kind of, with those kind of fighters, it's more about, you know, where do you generate the loss of revenue from the gate? Who takes the yeah. hit on that? Probably me. But sometimes the Does fighters, affect, sometimes like, the Povetkin White, if that goes... No, look, not, goes look, for instance, Povetkin White might do a million quid on the gate, right? So if you go behind closed doors, how do you substitute that million quid? Okay, probably some fewer costs because you're not in a big arena. You, you know, uh, probably maybe you take a fight or two off the undercard. Then you go back to the fighters maybe and say, this is a situation, what do you want to do? They'll probably say, well, what do you want to do, Eddie? 
you want to do this, you shouldn't make any money out of this show. If we, you know, or we go back to Sky or to Zone and you say, come on, guys, we've got to substitute this gate. How are we going to do it? Everything's different. If you're in a situation where you're having a comeback fight or a warm up fight with no, with limited risk, you might be prepared to take less money. If you're in a fight that could define your career, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to take less money. But to fight quicker, there might be scenarios where that might happen. You know, Bob Arum's already talking about poor fighters have got to be more realistic now. You know, it's a, probably a chance some people are thinking about resetting the market. You know, I don't really see it like that. I just think we have to find a way to stage the mega fights. And you know, when you talk about an AJ fight, the gate could be 10 million. You know, you talk about a Canelo, Billy Joe Saunders fight, the gate's 8 million. You don't just go, oh, we'll do it in a the studio then. I oh, don't worry about the 10 mil. Come on, mate. I want to get this fight away. So you've got to be creative. You've got to think on your feet and you've got to find solutions. What percentage of money would uh, a fighter on a next-gen show lose? No, we don't want the fighters to lose any money. It's but not, you they're, know, they're not, not going to be the same, are they? No, they're not. Well, there's going to be a reset, you know? So it's like, but you might say, when we come back, it's, you know, certain fights are going to be off, offered to fighters. And I know that a lot of promoters are thinking, you've got to go back to the fight and say, well, there's no gate, so you've got to take X. I understand that's going to happen. Rather avoid it where we can. But it's more like, if you, if you want to get out, if you want to have a fight that's pretty straightforward, of course, you might want to consider that. But if it's a big fight, you might want to say, no, you know what, I'll wait six months. But the market may never be the same. But surely, Ed, a lot of them fighters will think, especially like, say like a Buatzi or someone might think, he hasn't fought for, for so long. Fuck it, I'll take, I'll take slightly less money and just get myself out. Yeah, I just don't like the conversation, to be honest with you. I don't like... Yeah, I feel very, very awkward about going to a fighter and saying, I know some, some promoters are going to prey off it, but I can understand if it's a, if it's a run-out job. But I want to get rid of the run-out jobs in these, in, now. You know? So now we're saying that in the short term, we want as many British fighters on the card as possible, right? For logistical reasons. So rather than you having a run out against a 10 rounder against Lucas from Poland, why don't you fight Dave from Manchester, who's 10 and 0? That's going to be better for the sport, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be better for British boxing because small hall boxing right now is finished. Until Gates return, small hall shows will not exist. It's impossible. Um, unless people are prepared to lose tens of thousands of pounds. Okay? So, those fighters that are on the small hall shows will be saying, oh, I'll step up, take a risk. You know, like I just said, Dave from Manchester, he's 10 and 0. He's a massive ticket seller. But normally, his, his manager or promoter doesn't want him to going to gamble on a TV show yet. We're quite happy doing our little thing on our show, selling our 400 tickets. Thank you very much. Now, Dave from Manchester needs a payday. Dave from Manchester's got to take a risk. And our guys have got to say, yeah, I'll fight Dave from Manchester instead of Lucas from Poland. And there's nothing wrong with Lucas from Poland. From lo He's a lovely fella. What do you think about Wack and Johnson, Ed? What, pay-per-view? Hmm. I'm just going to move the phone because... I need to get um, some charge, so we could have another great little, uh, great little moment here. Um, I mean, what, what do you mean? What do I think of Wacken Johnson? I mean, what game pay per view? Well, I just think not that, just pay per view, but that seems like the first kind of show with any recognised fighters that's been announced. Well, it's in Poland, isn't it? It's not. I mean, but let me try this. I'm going to put it in some plants. Yeah. What what's this to your left? What's that? That. Oh, it's a curtain. curtain. Yeah. That's all right, isn't it? Yeah, that's all right. Go on. So when you talk about Wok and John, I mean it's just it's how it is, like what the fans have got to understand. And whack against Johnson is a horrific example. But when we talk about substituting the live gate. How do you do that? So when you've got whack against Johnson, for example, they're going, well, 
the only way we can do that is to try and generate more money. So why don't we put it on pay-per-view and take a punt that it's going to do certain numbers? I mean, that's a really bad example, right? But when I've been speaking to some small hall promoters, what they're saying is the only choice we've really got without TV revenue is to try and do pay-per-view on YouTube. Might be two quid a show. Because something has to substitute the game. Especially for, you know, if we're doing, um, I don't know, our O2 show, right? Uh, Kelly Abanesian, et cetera, et cetera. You might take 400 grand on the gate. All of a sudden that comes off and, and maybe even 400 grand on the gate gives you a break even show. So now to do that show behind closed doors, it's gonna, you're going to lose 400 grand. That ain't a great business. Would you? And if, you're, if you're a small hall show, if you're a small hall show, you might be generating anywhere between twenty and forty grand on the show, on the gate. So you think that a small hall promoter is going to say, "Oh, I'll go ahead anyway and just lose thirty grand on a show"? It's impossible. So this is our greatest challenge, and I'm up for it. I'm excited because I kind of feel like I've completed boxing anyway. Sorry, I kind of feel like I've completed boxing. So now let's see how good we really are because it was getting a little bit easy. You know, come into the UK, wallop, gave everyone a little spanking on the bottom, on the bottom, went over to, to USA, still work in progress, but completely drove people potty over there, completely ripped up the marketplace, went to Italy, bongiorno, went over to Spain, hola. So, yeah, we had more to do, but now, Let's see how good we really are. Can I say one thing? You as a promoter cannot say you've completed boxing until you've helped make the Joshua Fury fight. Yeah, it was tongue in cheek, but No, but it's you not. Know. You you mean it. You mean what No, you're you right, it's not actually. No, you you are right, yeah, it's not. But it's I say things like that and I'm sort of half joking, half not joking, where Again, this goes back to my interview where I got a little bit of stick for the Usyk Chisora press conference where I was like, roll up your sleeves, come on, you know, we'll, we'll overcome this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now I feel like that, that speech is more relevant. And I'm excited to see how we resolve this. I'm excited to see how we find answers, how we find solutions. I'm excited to see what kind of environment do we create behind closed doors. I don't want to, to do closed, behind closed door events in York Hall with no one in it. I don't want to do it in a dark studio in the middle of nowhere. I want to create an environment which is visually impactful, which creates a little bit of drama and nerves for a fighter that looks the absolute dog's bollocks and has Matram's stamp on it and says, this goes down in history because this is what Matram did when we came back from a disaster. And I want to make sure ours is the best, ours is the most efficient, ours looks the best, you know, and we will do that. And it's not, when this first happened, I was thinking, quick, quick, you know, May, let's get back in May, oh, June. And now it's like, let's get back, but let's make sure it's right and it's ready, you know. And I think when you start thinking about fighters as well, fighters aren't going to be ready in June, in my opinion. Some would be, but you know, any fighter in a championship fight needs to spar, right? So gyms, when are gyms going to open? Even private gyms, I mean, middle of May, something like that. So when are you going to be able to get sparring? I don't know, middle, end of May. So you're going to need three or four weeks of sparring, for the, certainly for the bigger fights, to, to you know... Um, Get yourself in in a, in ready for the big fight. So, um, I think July is realistic, and we will one hundred percent subject to some kind of change of of the the direction things are going. Be back in July. Hey, just going back to um, Dylan White, Sky Sports ran a story yesterday where. Dylan White saying that to Fury that if Wilder, because of his bicep surgery, isn't going to be ready, um, let's get it on. But 
stuff. I mean, look, I think everybody's looking for a bit of clickbait at the moment. That was a pretty standard line, which was like, if Wild, if Wild is not ready, I'm ready. Let's go. Do you know anything more about his his bicep and his surgery and when he could be? I don't ready? know nothing about it. It's all quite hush hush, isn't it? But I, mean, I would have gone for that. I would have gone for that excuse rather than the uh, ring walk suit. Well, Bob Arum has come out, I think, yesterday and said that the Wilder Fury fight is more likely for November or December of this year. Yeah, well, because they need a gate. So we go back to our conversation a couple of minutes ago. Gate for that fight might be 10 million as well. Um, all right, moving on. You did a press conference with uh, Fowler and OD, which yeah. is tomorrow. How did that go? It was quite amusing, actually. Um, I haven't really spoke to OD for a couple of years, really. He sent um, you a tweet yesterday, didn't he? Yeah, I was going to reply, and I just thought, oh, I can't be bothered, because I was going to say, mate, I just spoke to you for half an hour, and you never said anything. So, uh, OD's OD. Um, I think, as you learn more, as things change, would I have done the same thing now? Maybe. Maybe not. But, you make decisions, don't you, at a time. And at the time, it, I felt like it was the right decision. So, um, I Do like OD. Decision, then? Do I regret it? Yeah. No. No. I might have done if he went and won a world title. Yeah. That was a joke. He still could. But, no, I just think I... We may have overreacted, but I don't know. At the time, there was so much heat on it. And it wasn't the first time, you know. Um, there was other reasons behind it as well, you know, but maybe it was a bit harsh. Just I felt like at the time, I don't know, got a lot of friends in Liverpool. I know what it means to them. I don't know. But, you know, like I said, I like OD. I think he's a great entertainer. I mean, he was golden on this uh, StubHub rival show. Who got the other hand? I'd say, I mean, who was more, I get, look, OD's always going to be more entertaining, isn't he? Because he don't stop talking. OD's a great, he's, he's great to just spark interest in fights. You know, I think at one stage, he's like, you know, I've been thinking about things and yeah, Fowler's a prick, you know, and he just, he just went into one and he started putting out this olive oil where he said it's more effective than the CBD oil that Fowler's <laughs> it's quite, it's all over the place. What CBD? And, um, what? What is CBD oil? Fowler's thing. Yeah, what is it? It's cannabis oil, isn't it? Oh, all right. Okay. I don't know. You don't know what CBD oil is? No. All right. Okay. I've got sent some. I still don't know what it is. Cannabis oil without the cannabis, basically. Okay. I got sent some the other day. Shout out. Um, I can't remember the company now. I've, I've, not, um, I've not tried it, but, but a lot of people swear it by it. A lot of people swear by it. You um, probably don't need it because you're such a machine. Absolutely. Edward, how realistic is this? Is it a load of pie in the sky? Are you actually thinking well, about think, taking this way? Look, at the end of the day, day we way. have to make... Look, the one fight I want to make more than anything is Fitz against Fowler. Right? OD's got a fight, McKenna, in the MTK Golden Tournament final. Great fight. Yeah. Um, and then, like, I don't see why that fight should... We have to make fights that you want to see. At Do you want to see? At what weight? 150. My, Fowler says he can make 150. I'm, I, I'm not so sure he can make 150. But anyway, do you want to see that fight? Do you want to see OD back in Liverpool? <laughs> and wait till we, what, I asked him that question about fighting in Liverpool. Wait till you see the response. I ain't going to go down very well. How, how, long was, how long was it? Half an hour. Half an hour? Um, Edward, also, is it looking less likely that the Billy Joe Saunders and Canano fight will happen? No, look, Triple G has a contract to fight Zeremeta. So that's the fight that he should be taking. That's a fight he wants to get out of the way. You know, that fight can happen in August time. And then he wants to fight Canelo in December or whenever it is. So if he has that fight, Canelo will probably have a fight before Triple G. And that will be Billy Joe Saunders, in my opinion. The, the problem, again, we go back to the same problem, the gate. You know, if you had a pot of money for Canelo and Billy Joe, 
and you took eight million from that pot, where does it come from? Someone has to take less money. Uh, a sponsor, a broadcaster has to pay more money. You have to take something off the undercut. You, know, it's, there has to, you have to find a solution. We don't just live in a world where we just say, yeah, do that one, do that one, and then it's whatever, whatever it is, it is. What no, could be the there's plan? too many, there's too many, go on. What could be the plan for Usyk and Chisora then? In the midst Same of thing, the want to do that in front of a crowd. But again, we'll get to a stage where we have to look at alternatives. Another country, behind closed doors, tough, tough. That's a tough one to do behind closed doors, just as AJ and Pulev. Like, could be impossible. But we'll try. We'll try and find a solution. But we hope. I mean, if I asked you, when do you think crowds will be allowed back at sports? No earlier than September. Yeah, well, that's for sure. But for me, I feel it might be more like October, November, December. Certainly November, December, we hope. But there is a possibility, maybe not till next year. Won't a lot depend on how the Premier League resolves itself as well? Yeah, but, don't, but let's, let's, not, let's not forget, we're, we're a unique sport, aren't we, that rely on the services of the NHS in a needing moment, you know? So if a fighter is injured and requires medical emergency, we rely on the NHS. So we cannot, how we are, possibly put any more pressure on the NHS at all by being selfish and greedy and starting too early that a fighter gets injured, God forbid, at a show, is taken to hospital. And, you know, we need to, one, make sure that it, it's as safe as possible for all fighters and that all fighters are given 100% best medical care and attention. But number two, we have to make sure that the NHS are okay with that. Do they have the capacity to make sure that they can give the right attention to this fighter, you know? And that's more of a British Boxing Board of Control thing. And that's the thing that the board are waiting on and talking to doctors about and saying, okay, when you feel, when the doctors feel they'll be available, when the NHS is comfortable and everybody's comfortable that in the event of an emergency, we can treat this athlete in the correct manner and in a manner that will give that boxer you know, the best medical attention and also it won't be putting extra pressure on the NHS. And for me, that mix is going to come together in July. The Premier League will start, it's not like you know, other things we do, <coughs> darts, snooker. You can create a studio, can't you? And just put some darts players in there, make sure they're all tested. But this requires different kind, you know, different kind of logistics, you know, uh, judges, referees, um, Sanctioned bodies, drug testers, media, possibly. I mean, you messaged me the other day and said, oh, obviously, I'll be allowed in. I didn't say that. Well, you were like, I, 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 said, no, I said, maybe there's there, no media. I said, is there the possibility if you was in a quarantine situation? You, you, didn't, you didn't quite put it as politely. Yeah, no, I did. I did. I no, know exactly not really. I did. No, you were like, geez, come on. You know what I mean? Surely you can slip me in the back door, geese. You know what I mean? Did I say that? Something like that. So the answer is, I don't know who, you know, how it's going to work, but we are a little bit different. But the Premier League's interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's so many barriers to overcome. I know that the Premier League are planning to return in June. But they also know it might be July. Okay. Uh, moving on, Eddie. I know you did this on an Instagram Live. Are you doing one this week? Might do. I don't know, you're getting bored of it now. No, do a random one. Okay, that was hard work, that was. But it was good, it was good. I know, but it was like, you're scrolling through and all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. I'll, I'll always be here to help you start off. Thanks, mate. No, that did, that was big for me. That was big. Ed, I know you spoke about it on there, but I just wanted to kind of get your view on the whole situation regarding Devon Haney. Um, I know you spoke to him about it and let him kind of... Uh, explain to a certain degree what was going on. But Talking about him becoming champion or his comments about... Well, both, really, uh, but I was talking about the comments. For me, um, I can't win because people go, oh, you're just protecting him. But I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't... It didn't offend me. Right? And 
Um, I don't know. Video. Can you see why what? people would look at it as a film? Yeah, I guess so. It didn't. It, listen, it didn't offend. I don't know why it didn't offend me. Maybe because I know the kid and I just know what he's like. And you know, this all stems really from what Bernard Hopkins said yeah, to course. Joe Calzaghe, which is, "I'll never let a white boy beat me" or something like that. Yeah. And the way Devin said it was kind of like mimicking what Hopkins said, but what it was just a silly thing. Hopkins? A dig at Hopkins. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know. I mean, they had a little back and forth, didn't they, a while ago? Yeah. But I don't know. I think sometimes the problem is with Devin is he is, you know, he's fantastic in front of the media mm-hmm. and he'll do every interview possible. So this was an interview with quite a small outlet where he said something stupid that he shouldn't have said and it just went completely out of control and he had to come out and apologise for it. So... um was I offended by it? I have to be honest. Not really. Should he have said it? Absolutely not. Because you just don't say things like that, do you? you know, I can't sit here and say, oh, what's wrong with that? You know, it's just you don't say it. It's just, but he said it. He said, sorry. I know what kind of person he is. You know, I mean, I'm his promoter. So do I think he's racist or it was racist? No, absolutely not. But should he have said it? Absolutely not. Moving on to the WBC situation, obviously that's ever changing. It's probably changed by the time yeah. it goes out. But <laughs> so for me, like Devin wanted to fight Lomachenko. Okay, Devin won a final eliminator and an interim title, and we pushed for Devin to be called as Lomachenko's mandatory. Okay. They elevated Lomachenko to franchise champion and therefore elevating Devin to world champion. Right? It's not his fault. He wanted to fight Vasily Lomachenko, but now he's WBC world champion. So he has a defense on the Logan Paul card and then he gets told that he can't fight because he's got surgery. So he's out till June. Then the WBC put him in recess. For me, it was only seven months for the injury. I don't see why you should go in recess for seven months. So they put him in recess and made the title available. For me, they shouldn't have done that. But anyway, so then they made Luke Campbell against Javier Fortuna for the world title with the winner having to fight Haney when he comes back from recess. All of a sudden, COVID unfolds. Campbell can't fight Fortuna. And Devin Haney says, well, I'm no longer in recess. I'm available. Now, under the WBC rules, if that title is vacant, and the fighter comes back from recess, he's just slot straight in as champion. But obviously, if you're Luke Campbell, you're saying, wait a minute, you've ordered me for the world title against Fortuna, and now I'm fighting for the interim world title. So they're following their rules, but at the same time, you've got to feel for Luke Campbell because he's now not fighting for the WBC world title. He has to beat Fortuna and then fight Haney. So, I understand, listen, I understand, it's all good for me because I represent both guys, and, and in this situation, I spoke to both their lawyers and I said, you have to submit your argument to the WBC. The fact is, is the WBC rules will favour Devin Haney in this situation. And unfortunately for Luke Campbell, it's cruel for him because now he has to fight for an interim title. I mean, we could debate it all day. It's, it's, it's strange, but, you know, my, most importantly, I'm more concerned about when. And maybe we just do... Campbell against Haney now. Well, you like you said, you've got both fighters, so exactly. So you know, I, I don't. I would rather Luke Campbell fight Devin Haney than fight Javier Fortuna for the interim title. So maybe that's something we look at. Um, Edward, are you going to tempt Tony Bellew out of retirement? No, no, never, ever. I mean, I was actually felt quite sorry for him because you know he talks so. So when we done, have you seen the show by the way? Yes. Vernon Bell, you talked so Do you rate it? Yeah, it was good. I have to. I it was really good. It. Numbers are good. Obviously, not as good as your numbers, but for our little YouTube channel, if you haven't liked, subscribed, and registered yet, or joined Matchroom Boxing YouTube channel, please do it. It's done really good numbers. And all it was, he phoned me up last week and he was talking about UFC. And it's just Tony, you know, oh, I could tell you what I could, I could do him, you know. And then Ruiz came up and it was like, get me Ruiz. I'll play with him. I'll beat him easy. 
So I brought it up in the interview, and I should probably never have brought it up. The next thing, it's like, Bill, you could come out of retirement. They were even messaging each other last night. But I would never let Tony Bell you get in the ring again. And if he did, it would be with another promoter. And he would never fight without me. So it ain't happening. Because I don't want to see Tony, one, maybe get hurt. You know, he, he won't agree with that. But two, kind of like, one thing I love about Tony is, for years and years... He was mocked, wasn't he? He was like, he was thought of as just a bit of a loud mouth scouser, British champion, but like, oh. and he worked so hard to win the European light heavyweight, win the European cruiserweight, fight for the, you know, people forget that he came through two Chilemba fights. Now, no one was horrendous, but he came through those two fights, ended up going to Canada and fighting Adonis Stevenson, got spanked out there. Came back, moved up to cruiserweight, watched the Matthias Masternak fight back for the European cruiserweight title. It was a brutal war. It was an underrated win, that. Massively underrated. Massively. And that was he was fighting for his career that night. Came back, beat Macabu at, at Goodison Park. Look at what Macabu's done now. He's now WBC world champion. He's been on a run beating like three of the best cruiserweights in the world. So Tony won that. He defended his world title. He beat David Hay twice at heavyweight. Now, we know Hay was injured, you know, an injury in the first fight, but still, he still stepped up. He battered him in the second fight. And then he tried to become undisputed champion by fighting one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters of all time. And was, by the way, arguably winning that fight till he got knocked out and Usyk was the better man on the night. So, I'm so proud of what he's achieved. He's got a load of money. He's got a beautiful house. He's got his health. He could fight tomorrow. Like, He's got loads left in the tank. But don't, never turn the engine off when the tank is, is dried out. Always leave yourself a little bit of petrol in the tank, you know, because it keeps the engine moving better. So I, what makes me so proud is look at him looking back. And, and it makes me so proud as well. Just all the haters, you know, because you can't mock Tony Bell you. The only thing you can mock him of is when he says in his interview, don't call me again. I don't want to be seen again. I'm going into hiding for the rest of my life. Next thing, he's launching our show. He's got the SAS. He's on Liga Dero. But listen, it's been what? Over, uh, over two years, isn't it? Yeah. It's been over two years or nearly two years since the Usyk fight. He's got to go out and do a few bits and pieces. I love Tony. I think he's a great... I think he's... I think if you don't like Tony Bell you, I don't think you're a proper person. That'll probably get some stick, but I don't, you know, you know him, don't you? Like, yeah. how can you not like Tony Bellew? I've always liked Tony Bellew, but yeah, he's, he's one of them people that kind of has his uh, critics online. As of course, but he's outspoken. Mm. So you're always going to have your critics. You haven't got to agree with everything he says, by the way, but he's a proper geezer. Edward, just a couple more things before we finish. Would you promote Frotch and Calzaghi? If they both come out, would you get involved in that? Probably. Never going to happen. Never. Joe will never fight again. But, you know, it's, listen, there's a couple of fights that I, I wish that could have been made, which, you know, Frotch and Kalzaghi was a little bit before my time, but I would have loved to have seen that fight. But Frotch against Golovkin was the one that I wish we could have, we could have got. Um, Frotch against De Gale. Great little crossroads fight at the time. The one um, more realistic from all that was Frotch and Chavez, which had never happened, obviously, wasn't it? Well, he should have, you know, I say he should have taken that fight. That was just, he knew, he didn't want it anymore. You know, we, we got offered a lot of money to fight Chavez in Vegas, and it was always Carl's dream to fight in Vegas. He does kick himself a little bit about that fight, but he wanted to end it on, on uh, Wembley, you know? And I respect him for that because, you know, he, ne he, he never, he just said, that's me. And I think a few niggles in training and I think he shut, you know, elbow and shoulder. And I think he felt that it was his time. Ed, can't believe I haven't asked you about this, but I will ask you about it now. Warrington, Shakur mm -hmm. Stevenson, 
On yeah. my board. That was all going off last week. What? Yeah, it was interesting. And I think this is sometimes comes down to like, sometimes a fighter doesn't get told of certain offers because the management team feel that it's just not good enough. So Andre Ward messages me and says, you thought your offer was solid, but we didn't think your offer was solid, basically. And then Shakur Stevenson come on and said, you've never made me an offer. Well, I know for a fact an offer was made. Uh, Harrison Whitman knows about the offer from top rank. Aaron will know about the offer. James Prince, I believe, was told about the offer as well. And I'm not saying, all oh, they kept it from the fight. I just think Andre Ward probably thinks that fight's worth five times what we offered. It's not. And I said, your promoter was happy with that offer. They were. They thought that number was sensible. But Shakur's management team obviously didn't. And I'm not, I'm not knocking them for that. I'm not, oh, you idiot, Shakur. No, no, no. You, you, have a, you believe that your fighter is worth X. That's fine. But I didn't. And your promoters didn't. And the only reason it got my back up is well, two things. Number one is, oh, well, Eddie Hearn and Warrington didn't want the fight. Yes, we did. You never made us an offer. Why can't you make us an offer if you want the fight so bad? We were the only ones making offers. And the second thing was, and I, I messaged him, he DM'd me actually, and he said, send me the offer. And I said, I'm not sent. You've got a pr promotional company and a management company. I'll send you that offer. Next thing, I'm getting a letter for torturous interference from Top Rank. I said, but don't call me a liar because that, um, that's not on. So he's like, okay, cool. I said, so when you realise there was an offer, oh, I expect you to come out and say, fair enough, there was an offer. Because I'm not, with all due respect, I ain't just going to come out and start tweeting that we never made an offer and like, just making it up. So there was an offer. His team didn't believe that offer was good enough. That's all. It's no big deal. But don't come out and say Warrington didn't want the fight. Warrington wants that fight. Frank Warren made them an offer to make that fight. We then made them an offer. I know what the Warren offer was and ours was better. But obviously it wasn't good enough. As Andre Ward said, it wasn't, they didn't think it was a solid offer. We did. No big deal. We move on. But don't say you didn't want the fight and don't say I'm lying. End of. You don't like being called a liar, do you? No, I don't actually. You can call me what you want. A little bit chubby, arsehole, prick. Don't like liar. Cheat as well. Cheat's the worst thing you can be. Especially in sport. Ed, I did, um, I did like a light version of what you did, really. A little Instagram live uh, recently. And uh, Gerald Miller popped on. Had a couple of things to say about you and, and AJ. But he did an interview, I think, with uh, Michelle Phelps. I haven't seen it, but I've seen the quotes from him. Mm where he said that, you know, he'd put AJ in a casket quote from the interview. What, what Did you see that? What did you make of that? I think he's disgusting. I think, um, I don't know why people give him the airtime to talk like that without actually questioning it. Let's just break one thing down. And you know what? I ain't going backwards and forwards with Drill Miller. Don't stop talking about me. One thing I'll tell you is, you fronted this guy up. You told the world what you were going to do to him. And do you know what you needed? to try and beat Anthony Joshua. Do you know what you needed to do to believe you could beat Anthony Joshua? Stick needles in yourself and take banned substances to try and do this to Anthony Joshua. That's how confident you were. You cheated. You cheated. And there's nothing worse than a cheat in sport. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And once again now, I'm going to put him in a casket. You ain't ever going to get the chance, mate. You know why? Because you had the chance, you couldn't help yourself. You couldn't do it genuinely. You looked this man in the eye, you told him you were going to do all these things, and you went away and you put stuff inside you to try and give you an edge. You cheated. That is it. You've told me before that Joshua still wants that Miller fight. He does, but I don't, you can't look at what we're, where we're going. Pulev, Fury, probably Fury twice. Like Dillian White, he wants to fight. Why should Jarrell Miller get the opportunity to come back and fight him? I, listen, who knows what's going to be, but I'm just telling you how I feel right now. You can't talk up 
Like, and now he says, yeah. And now he's trying to re-talk himself into the fight. Let's see him back in the ring first. Listen, again. I, I always feel I have a soft spot for Jarrell Miller. But when he talks like that about me, I've got to tell you it straight. You cheated me. You cheated to try and win a fight that you said you were going to do this, do that in. And I could never look at you in the same way. But I wish you the best for your career. He might force himself into a mandatory position. You never know. Maybe, and then we'll fight him. I heard you... I understand what I'm saying, though. Yeah, you I... won't say it anyway, but look, you know. So I understand what you're saying. Um, Edward, I saw you on Sky Sports doing the rounds the other day. Yes. Which I was on beforehand a couple of weeks ago, but anyway. Well, obviously, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't available the first week. So. Of course. Um, but yeah, when you were asked about kind of the one fighter that you regret. Yeah, I know. It just, it's, when I, well, it's only when I said that, I thought, oh, here we go. This is, this is going to be what the whole story is based out on. They went, who do you regret not signing? I was like... I, mean, I don't know really. And they went, go on, give us someone. And I was like, Tyson Fury. And then it was like, whew, the floodgates just opened. Yeah, but that must be and the all I said was, regret not signing it. That must be I the don't really, Do you know what? It's, honestly, people won't believe this, but with how things have worked out, I would not want to represent AJ and Fury right now. Because when that fight happens, I am so all in with AJ. I don't want, I don't want, you see that fight, Q? I, you know, sometimes I have to sit there in a fight, like, and I've got red corner, blue corner, both people I love, you know, and it's like, that fight, I want to be up, God, son, God, son, God, son. But not like, oh, Eddie, who do you think is going to win? Oh, I can't really say. Um, it's a tough one, really. And who would you prefer to win this fight? Well, they're both great guys, you know. I just want to come out, and my, my heart and soul is with AJ in that fight. And but when you were there in Monaco, weren't you? When Fury came over for meetings yeah. with me, and uh, there was a deal in place, and he asked me for a deal, and he told me the people he wanted to fight, and I was just like, no, because I didn't believe he'd have the two fights and then fight Wilder, because it was always the plan that we discussed to probably have three, or maybe four fights, and then do a fight like that. So if I would have known we would have gone two fights, Wilder. I would have just copped the first two, which ended up being Sepha, Sephiri and Pianetta, you know. But at the time, I thought, no, nah, it's got to be better than that. And, and to be fair, I looked at him and thought, no chance anyway. And as I said in the interview, how wrong he proved me. You can't knock him. You know, I know that he'll say stuff about me and I'll say stuff about him, but I respect Tyson Fury a lot and I, I admire what he's done. Just think AJ beats him. We're all entitled to our opinions, Edward. Yeah, um, what's your opinion, mate? Huh? What's your opinion on that one? I think the fans win, mate. <laughs> I do, I do. I've got, they I do, just, though. I they believe, do, they believe, do. If the fight happens, the fans win. Anyway, moving on. Um, all right, well, listen. You've given quite a... Thanks, mate. I've got the old hist- history now as well. What are you doing? What is that? What is that? It was homeschooling. Oh, no, sorry. I thought you said kiss tree. I thought you were doing another DJ. No, 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 no. No, I mean, yeah, I've got to speak to my agent later to see when the next set is, so. I what are you know. doing on GQ? What's that? GQ is an Instagram live, some kind of like house party. That's on Thursday at 6 p.m. Tune in. Yeah, but what are you doing? What, like, were you just being you? I don't know. I think, um, again, my agent came on and he was like, you know, GQ have been on and they're just after someone who's current, stylish, cool, sexy, successful. Um, they couldn't find anyone, so you up for it? And I'm, yeah, it's me, Maya who Jammer and who Karen Elson. Sorry, who, who is your agent? Uh, that's, that's confidential. To be honest with you, I'd rather not talk about that kind of stuff because you know. No, if someone of... to book you for a gig, who do they go through? Yeah. Don't book me for. A... What do you think I am, Coogan Cassius? Book me for a gig. No, but I'm being serious. If someone wanted to get hold of you, what, they a wedding, to open Greg, a mitzvah. Free? A new great right. or rumble what? or rumbelows. They wanted you to open one of these. Do you stores. know this is this is going to make you laugh? Do you know I've now had four approaches to like front 
an advertising campaign for four different brands. What brands? And I know it will surprise you. One wasn't Calvin Klein. Uh, but it, they've been quite, some have been cringe. Big, big brands. But what I can't ones? bring myself. What? What I'm not saying. Give me one. Barclays. McDonald's. Oh, shut up. I swear. McDonald's want you what? What as a tech? So, so, <laughs> so it was, it was like, honestly, it was, it was the launch of the vegan burger, right? And the vegan sausage roll or something. And I had to like basically promote, hey, we've got the burger over here. Oh, hello, look over here, it's a sausage roll. And I was like, I went back to the person working on it. I was, you know, he's like, you know, it's quite a substantial fee here. I went, mate, I can't do it. You know, it's like Rocky Balboa with the aftershave. When I wake up in the morning, I like to smell great with my cologne. Would have been like that. Why didn't you do it? You should have just done it for Bantz. No, there's a couple of others floating around at the moment, um, which I'll tell you about if I don't do. And I might do one of them because it's actually quite amusing. Every little bit helps, Ed. Yeah, but I don't want to make a complete tear out of myself. I've done that on that fighting fit thing. You know, oh, the, the guys oh, were like, Ed, you do, you do it. About that. What? You did better than what I expected that to be. Hey, I did horrendous. Did you see the size of the weights? In the end, when my, my shoulders had gone, I was like, they were about that big. It was embarrassing. I watched it back. And that, the lads were like, come on, Ed, you've got to get involved. You've got to. So you do it, and then you think, and I'm doing it, and they're all absolutely wetting themselves while we're filming. By the way, fighting fit, 8 a.m. every morning on Sky Sports. Great way to start the day. If not, it is available on demand. Great plug. All right, Edward. Well, thank you very much for your time. Also, uh, the boxing show. New show on yeah, Sky Sports I've launches this Friday. Yeah. yeah. On Sky Sports main event? Yes, and Sky Sports News, I believe, as well. Okay. Are you on it? It's me and my old man first. So, you know, my old man now he's had a heart attack, keeping a low profile, he says. So he wants to go on the launch of the first show. Okay. He's, he's, he's basically up there with Bell, you, isn't he? It's all right. Let him crack on. Um, all right, Ed, have you got any closing words? Yes, guys. No, just stay well, stay safe, hang in there, and warm the engines up. Warm the engines up and get prepared to start those engines for the relaunch of this country. Do you like my T-shirt? Can't really see it. Is that Paulie Yates? It's Peggy Mitchell. No, it's not. Ed, is, is it Paulie Yates? No, it's not Paulie Yates. No. Edward, thank you very much for talking to IFL TV. Cheers, guys. We'll Stay safe. Love you all.